Well, shalom. My name is Todd Bennett, and this is the weekly uh, audio video recording of the Shema Israel newsletter titled Home is Where the Heart Is. It was first published on day nine of month four on the Creator's calendar, also known as July 9th, 2022, on the Roman calendar. Now, last week we talked about the words of Yeshua concerning a house divided. There are several different accounts found in the Brit Hadashah text, and one of them that we read is in Mark as follows. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Now, we know that when he spoke these words, he was actually in a house, because it's uh, stated in Mark 3.19. It was not the house of his physical family, uh, and while in this setting, Yeshua expanded on the concept of a house and a family. The text says, Then his brothers and mother came, and standing outside, they sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him, and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of Elohim is my brother and my sister and mother. Now, while his physical family was outside the house, he stated that his true family consisted of those sitting around him in a circle within the house. So we have our physical families, but they're not always connected with us or aligned with our beliefs. When we join the covenant with Yahweh, uh, we have a new family, which may or may not include our physical family. Do you recall our discussion last week on swords? Yeshua not only told his disciples to buy a sword, well, he also stated that he came with a sword. He says, do not think I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he who does not take his execution stake and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So here again, he's dealing with uh, family, and uh, he's saying that families uh, will be divided. And uh, so this is not necessarily a message of unity uh, regarding families, but showing that you've got to prioritize your faith and your belief and your, and, uh, and your love for Elohim above that of your physical family. In fact, in Matthew 35 and 36, Yeshua is, is actually quoting Micah 7.7. 7. And the context is a faithless and a corrupted society, a, a wicked and adulterous generation. Uh, that he described as his in his day and similar to where we find ourselves today. When you stand up for the truth, that decision is bound to result in division. And how many of you, of course, know this to be true from your own lives? Uh, surely the family you grew up in, uh, with and in, believes in, in Jesus. Most in, in America do. But when you try to introduce them to Yeshua and his commandments, how do they respond at this point? Do, do they accept and promote a, a Jesus wrapped in an LGBTQ flag who just loves everyone? That's what the Antichrist in Rome is currently teaching, and that's what a lot of uh, modern Christianity teaches because of the doctrine of grace. Uh, or, or do they recognize and follow the true Messiah named Yeshua, whose identity has been hidden and whose teachings have been twisted by the wicked ones in man-made religious systems. It's a distinction with an eternal difference because Yeshua not only came with a sword, he is also going to send fire. Uh, remember what John prophesied, uh, John the Immerser? He said his winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, Yahweh previously built his house on a threshing floor, which was a prophetic picture 
of the future house that will be built by the Messiah. And you can read about, uh, of course, David uh, purchased the threshing floor and then Solomon later built the house on that threshing floor. You read that in Second Chronicles 3.1. Before Yeshua builds his house, he is going to clean out his threshing floor with unquenchable fire. And that is the language of judgment. In fact, he specifically stated, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. Uh, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two, and two against three. Father will be divided against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Uh, again, we see this happening all over the place, especially when people choose to follow uh, the true Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. Uh, that's when families really get divided. And Yeshua predicted that it would happen. Now, I hear some Christians saying, send your fire, Lord, and let your fire fall down on me. And I don't think they really understand what they're asking for. Uh, Yeshua wanted to judge the planet when he came the first time. He, he was distressed that he couldn't start that process uh, in what he called, you know, a, a wicked and adulterous generation. But he had work that he needed to do first. And imagine if he didn't hold back. Imagine if he judged the planet and didn't renew the covenant with Israel. We would be in a very uh, bad position right now. But thankfully, he did not judge, but uh, he had mercy and, you know, when we talk about mercy and grace, uh, that's really what we're talking about. He held off judgment. You know, he, uh, Yah sent his son to renew the covenant. That's all mercy and grace. And uh, he renewed the covenant through his blood so that we can be saved from the fire. Again, that is mercy. That is favor. That is grace. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can just go on sinning after he's done that uh, that's a that is how the uh, christian religion has perverted this whole concept of grace well he is going to judge and when he rains down fire in the future he's essentially going to kosher the planet his fire will cleanse the planet by incinerating and judging all evil in a previous message we discussed the first judgment by water and then the second judgment by fire now, remember the parable of the wheat and the tares? Here's what Yeshua meant by the parable. He said, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. Uh, the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels or his messengers, and they will gather out of his kingdom all that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So this is a lot different than what uh, modern Christianity has taught about you know being left behind and all that. Look, when he comes back, he's coming to claim this planet, and he is coming to establish the kingdom on this planet. So he's removing those that offend. He's sending his messengers to remove the tares, and the tares are those who practice lawlessness. And we've read many times i mean i constantly harp on this because this is one of the major deceptions that's been perpetrated through christianity the doctrine of grace has has promoted lawlessness and people think they can continue to be lawless because they're under grace but in matthew 7 21 through 23 he specifically addresses that issue to many who call him lord and many who say they've done things in his name 
And uh, they think that they are in a re right relationship with him because of the things they are doing. But he says, essentially, you haven't done the will of the Father. You, you practice lawlessness, and as a result, I never knew you, so depart from me. And here he's saying what happens to those who practice lawlessness, who he tells to depart from them. And it's not a pretty picture. It in involves fire. So the tares will be taken and burned. And the key is to be left behind and gathered into the house like wheat into the barn. The fire destroys and purifies like a refiner's fire. So you'd better be filled with the gold and silver of righteousness that uh, Malachi refers to in Malachi 3.3. 3. You better have something that can withstand, can sustain the fire. The works of lawlessness are likened to wood, hay, and stubble. They will not endure the fire. So, contrary to the Jesus presented by Christianity who promotes peace and love, Yeshua the Messiah spoke words of judgment and division. He did not speak words that unified families. He was prophesying that families would divide because of him. As a, we, as a result, we want to make sure that we're in a family defined and represented by Messiah because he will be vouching for us before his father. Matthew 10, 32 uh, through 33 says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my father who is in heaven. So again, if you're confessing a, a Jesus, a lawless Jesus that, uh, you know, promotes lawlessness, uh, you're not confessing the proper Yeshua before men. And therefore, Yeshua is not going to confess you before the Father. So you better get your relationship with him straightened out. You better get your understanding of him straightened out. And then you better confess the true Messiah before men. And I pray that Yeshua confesses us all before the Father. But it's really no secret. Uh, he will only confess those who he knows, the, the wheat that he gathers into his barn. Uh, his words are very, very clear if you focus on his words in the scriptures. And you must be among those surrounding him in the house, not those who are outside the house claiming to be related to him. And of course, this blows the argument of the Jewish people right out of the water. They claim that the covenant land belongs to them simply because they can prove that they are Jewish, whatever that means. You know, in my previous uh, teaching series on the Israel Dilemma, we talk about that fluid and, and obscure uh, definition of, of a Jewish person. Well, the true test is whether he knows you. And his family consists of his sheep, those who hear his voice and Shema. They listen and obey. He told the Yahudim in Jerusalem, You do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Now remember the words uh, that the father spoke on the mountain to Peter, James, and John when Peter was suggesting that they build three sukkahs for Yeshua, Moses, and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. We read, And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. In other words, he was saying, Shema. The Father instructed us uh, to listen to Yeshua. He previously told Moses that he would send a prophet like him and that we should listen to him. In Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 19, we read, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among the brethren. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. Now Yeshua came in the name of Yah and spoke on behalf of his father, Yeshua, said that only those who do the will of the Father will be in the kingdom. And he specifically stated that he does not know those who practice lawlessness. In other words, those who disobey the commandments. Now, it's really very simple, as I said. So it's important to know and understand who your family is. A house divided results in new and different houses. A house of five will turn into a house of two and a house of three. 
two houses. Now, this is an interesting subject for me, as my family has converged in New York to pack up and move out of our house of, of many years. We finally have a signed contract and our closing date is scheduled for the end of the, the month. Praise all, you know, all praise be to Yahweh. Uh, thank you all for your prayers and please continue to keep us in your prayers as we finish up the process. And as we pack up a bunch of stuff, I'm amazed at all the junk that has amassed in the cupboards, cabinets, closets, and drawers over the years. And sifting through all of the accumulation, we find the nuggets of photos and things from the past that jog certain fond memories. And I can see the sadness in my, my children as they reminisce about the past where they grew up. While my family uh, called this cedar structure a home, for around 25 years, we also had a lot of memories elsewhere, which prompted my daughter to rhetorically posit, you know, what is a home? And that's an important question to consider, especially if you claim to belong to the house of Israel or the house of Judah. Uh, as we looked at pictures of our travels throughout the world and in our RV, it was clear that while the structure in New York may have been our home base, it was definitely not the only place we called home. Uh, the answer to the question of what is a home distilled down to the fact that home was where our family was, together, unified around Yeshua. Our home is wherever Yeshua leads us, wherever he wants us to be. And ultimately, our home will be in the covenant land. Uh, currently, we're dwelling in sukkahs, you know, and the word sukkah is a temporary dwelling, uh, and so we're, we're, we're dwelling in temporary dwellings and temporary locations until he gathers his home, uh, us home. And the question is, is that your definition of a home? I see most Americans are taught that home ownership is an integral part of the American dream and your greatest investment. The importance of home ownership is built into our society and ingrained into our psyche. We live in a consumer-driven culture where people are obsessed with buying homes, building homes, maintaining their homes, repairing their homes, and improving their homes. They then continue on an endless quest to acquire more and better items to fill and decorate their homes. And I would hazard uh, that a majority of people's spare time outside of their jobs is focused on their homes. Now compare that to how Yeshua spent his time. Uh, he didn't own a home. Uh, and he instructed his disciples to follow him while he was on the move, spreading the good news of the kingdom. After the resurrection, when they returned to their boats and their fishing careers, he, he reminded them that they were supposed to be fishing for the sons of Elohim. And that was why there were 153 fish in the net. Uh, in Hebrew, the term sons of Elohim equals 153. That's a really great mystery that you don't understand unless you understand the Hebrew. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived in tents, and they were on the move. And it wasn't until Jacob crossed over and returned to the land that we read about him building a house. In Genesis thirty-three seventeen, we read, And Jacob journeyed to Sukkot, uh, built himself a house, which is bait, and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkot. Even though he built a house, that did not last long. He journeyed on to Shechem, where he then bought some land. And as, as we discussed last week, he didn't settle down there either. He had to proceed to Beit El, the house of El, the house of Elohim. And how many people are buying land and building homes when they should be getting rid of their idols and visiting Beit El? And last week... When I was still in Texas, I pulled out a Torah scroll to show a brother the first word of the Torah, Bereshit, uh, spelled Bet, Resh, Aleph, Shin, Yud, Ta. It's translated as in the beginning uh, in, the, in the English, and but you don't glean much uh, from that translation, those three words. So it's with the one word, Bereshit, uh, translated as three words in English. The English doesn't say much, but the Hebrew text is an entirely Different story. It's filled with information. For instance, the first letter of that first word is an enlarged bet. Now, the bet is the second letter in the Hebrew Aleph Bet, and it represents a house in the ancient pictographic script. 
Now think about that. The entire Torah actually begins with a large picture of a house. Now if that's not sending a message, I don't know what is. Uh, but if that wasn't powerful enough, the Hebrew word for house, uh, bet, spelled bet yod ta, is also contained within that first word, bereshit. So clearly a house is important. It's just a question of which house. Well, look no further than the second letter of that first word, resh. So the letters bet resh literally mean house head and form the word bar. Uh, the Hebrew word bar means son, and the head of the house would be the firstborn son. So we want to be in his house, the house built by Elohim, the house of the firstborn son. We also see from the first word, bershit, that the house is filled with a covenant, which is a brit of fire, which is ash. And in fact, that word bershit is uh, got uh, the word covenant, brit surrounding the word f fire, ash. So uh, your house better be a covenant house, otherwise it will simply burn up uh, by fire. And that brings us back to the family. The family of Elohim consists of those in covenant with him. His people are called Yisrael, not the Christian church. The people of Yisrael are those who follow him. Currently, they're in exile, scattered throughout the world. And while there are some who try to claim that the house of Israel was restored long ago, that simply is not the case. I, I mentioned last week about Jeroboam and the sin of the golden calf at Beth El. Ezekiel prophesied that the house of Israel would be punished for 390 years for their sins. We read in Ezekiel 4, 4 through 5, Lie also on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of the days that you lie on it, you shall bear their iniquity. For I have laid on you the years of their iniquity according to the number of days, 390 days. So you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. So Ezekiel, he laid on his left hand side for 390 days. I mean, that's over a year long he physically lay there for people to watch him and, and observe uh, the punishment that Yah planned for the house of Israel. Now we know that the house of Israel was removed by the Assyrians around 721 BCE, which means that he would be we would be looking uh, for a return around 331 BCE. We you know when that 390 years was up, we'd expect that to see the house of Israel then return. Well, that didn't happen. There was no regathering of the scattered lost sheep. In fact, this was the time when Alexander the Great defeated the Persian Empire and Hellenized the land, which later fell under uh, Ptolemaic rule uh, until the Hasmonean Revolt. And that, that means the punishment was extended, as Moses foretold in Leviticus 26. That portion of the Torah details an important principle and establishes the fact that the punishments rendered by Yahuwah would be multiplied seven times if the people refused to turn and obey. Now remember that the house of Judah was exiled by the Babylonians for their sins, and according to Jeremiah, that exile would last for 70 years. Jeremiah 25, 11 says, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And Jeremiah 29, 10 said, For thus says Yahuwah, After 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good towards you and cause you to return to this place. Well, when the 70-year exile period was coming to an end, we find Daniel seeking an answer regarding the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. In Daniel 9, 1-2, we read, uh, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the scrolls the number of the years specified by the word of Yahweh through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. I urge you to read how Daniel prayed and repented with fasting and sackcloth and ashes on behalf of the house of Judah. Uh, further on in Daniel 9, 3 through 20. 
Now, so we don't see any evidence of this type of conduct from the house of Israel. Indeed, they assimilated into the nations during their exile and completely lost their identity, exactly as Hosea had prophesied in Hosea 1. The house of Israel failed to repent and obey after the 390 years had expired. As a result, their punishment was multiplied seven times to 2,730 years. And that's why we read about Yeshua coming for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They were still lost when he walked to the earth. In fact, their punishment did not end until around the year 2009, give or take some years, due to the fact that there were multiple Assyrian exiles. In other words, uh, the Assyrians didn't remove them all at the same time. It was a series of exiles. Some believe around seven. The question is whether you, like Daniel, have been praying about this matter. Has anybody been praying about this matter? Uh, when's the last time you repented for the sins of your forefathers and, and sought the end of the punishment over the house of Israel? When was the last time that you sat fasting in sackcloth and ashes? Now, I'm serious. I mean, that's what our forefathers did to express their humility. Are we better than them? Uh, just because we live in a more modern era doesn't mean that we approach Yah any differently. Here's another question. Do you even want to return to the land? From my experience, most people don't. They are comfortable in Babylon. And just like most of the Yahudim who failed to return after the 70-year exile period was over, uh, maybe a visit someday when things calm down, but right now it's just too dangerous. And that's what I hear all the time, and I find it simply amazing. Imagine if there were actual giants roaming the land as in the days of Abraham. Remember that Abraham's father, Terah, was originally called out of Babylon, uh, but he stopped short in Haran. I wonder if he feared the giants like the first generation of Israel's, Israelites that left Egypt and were afraid of the giants. Uh, well, that's a clear demonstration of the difference in faith taught by Christianity and the, re the faith required by Elohim for those who will dwell with him. If this generation refuses, Yahuwah will use the next generation. If you're too rooted in Babylon to follow him, he will simply bypass you. He'll let you die in Babylon or the wilderness. But what about grace? I, I can hear the Christians protesting now. Well, Yahuwah is definitely long-suffering, but he's not going to change his plan for you. Uh, you need to align yourself with him. Most Christians, though, they want to go to heaven, but that's not the future that their Bibles describe. They fail to understand that, that there is a specific land attached to the covenant promises. The land is real. It's not a metaphor. And the covenant that was renewed and made great by the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach, includes that land. And we just previously talked about these. He's coming uh, to claim that land. Uh, we read about in the, his uh, explanation of the parable of the tares and the wheat. Uh, that land is located on this planet. He's coming from, you know, on the clouds, and he's coming to this planet. He's not, uh, it's not in heaven. Uh, that's why he's coming on the clouds. Uh, the promise of a home with Elohim began with a garden planted by Yahuwah, and it ends with a city that will descend from heaven and be planted on a renewed earth. So our focus should be on a future home here on earth. Hosea prophesied that the house of Israel would be punished, but there would be a return similar to when Israel was brought out of Egypt. And we read, I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, all her appointed times. And, and you notice it says her appointed times rather than his appointed times. Some people try to use this for the fact that he's going to get rid of it all. But I don't know. Leviticus 23 describes his appointed times. But remember that under Jeroboam, the house of Israel changed their appointed times. So they are now belong to her, the house of Israel. They are her appointed times, her appointed feasts that she was doing uh, contrary to the instructions of Yah. He continues, And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, of which she has said, These are my wages 
that my lovers have given me. So I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. I will punish her for the days of the Baals, to which she burned incense. She decked herself with her earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers. But me she forgot, says Yahuwah. Therefore, behold, I will, I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. I will give her her vineyards from there in the valley of Accor as a door of hope. Uh, she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. And it shall be in, in that day, says Yahuwah, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. For I will take from your mouth the names of the Baals and they shall be remembered by their name no more. In that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, with the birds of the air, and with the creeping things of the ground. Bow and sword of battle I will shatter from the earth to make them lie down safely. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and loving kindness and mercy. So there's where we get the wedding from. A lot of Christians... Uh, you know, they understand the bride of Christ and, you know, that, you know, you, they think Jesus is coming back for his bride. Well, this is the, the foundation for that it's a remarriage from, with the house of Israel. So, again, if you want to be part of that bride, the five wise virgins, virgins Yeshua described, then you've got to be part of the house of Israel. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know Yahuwah. It shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, says Yahuwah, I will answer the heavens and they shall answer the earth. The earth shall answer with grain, with new wine, and with oil. They shall answer Jezreel. Then I will sow her for myself in the earth and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people, and they shall say, you are my Elohim. And of course, this is the... This is the um, conclusion of the punishment that was rendered in Hosea 1 and it was uh, depicted through the names of his children um, when they were uh, we called Jezreel and, and then and no mercy and not my people and then the process will reverse then and he will reverse the curse and uh, ultimately they will be his people they will be his uh, they will be his people he will be their Elohim and they will be called Elohim, I urge you to read Hosea 1 if you've never understood that process. So he's reversing it. He's bringing back the house of Israel from where they were scattered. And Yahuwah says he will allure the house of Israel, bring her into the wilderness, and speak comfort to her. And rem Do you remember the Valley of Accor? Because he mentions that in this, in this prophecy. It was the entranceway into the Promised Land beyond Jericho. And uh, here's what happened there after Jericho was destroyed. It says, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against Yahuwah Elohim of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. And there they are, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. Well, Achan wanted Babylon more than he wanted to obey. He actually stole from Yah, since the gold and the silver were supposed to go uh, to the treasury. And that was a grievous event which impacted all of Israel. They were being defeated by the enemy because the camp was defiled by Achan. Well, you know, he, had, he admitted and he confessed. And so, you know, that's the end of the story, right? Well... Read the response. It says, Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? Yahuwah will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So Yahuwah turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Accor to this day. 
The Valley of Accor literally means Valley of Trouble. Uh, that great heap stood as a witness to the fact that Israel had to get cleaned up in order to proceed through the threshold and into the land. And, you know, people need to understand that actions have consequences. You know, even though he is confessed his sin after he was confronted, that doesn't mean that there's no consequences. And, you know, sometimes the consequences are fierce. And that's the problem we see in modern Christianity today. It's this concept of grace. Most Christians would think, oh, he confessed to Joshua, so, you know, everything's all better. And uh, no, you know, some, some, there are consequences to our sins. Yes, we can be forgiven for our sins, but that doesn't mean we don't reap the consequences of our actions. So uh, it's important to remember. And have you ever considered the impact of your actions? Uh, I know that Americans have been taught to be free and independent, but that all stops at the Valley of Echor. Have you ever robbed Elohim and caused him trouble? Have you lusted for Babylon and caused trouble for Israel? Uh, our predecessors in the house of Israel surely have. Well, the good news is that in the future, the Valley of Akor will be a door of hope, Petatikvah. Uh, as Israel, we can all participate in that process. And if you want to move into the house, you need to get rid of your idols. You need to give Elohim what belongs to him, and you need to rid Babylon from your life. But if you can't let go, then you will remain in Babylon. Jeremiah prophesied that the future return of Israel would be greater than the exodus from Egypt. In fact, he declared, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says Yahuwah, that it shall be no more, said Yahuwah lives, who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but Yahuwah lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. For I will bring them back into their land which I gave to their fathers. Well, if I'm not mistaken, during the last Passover, everyone was still talking about the exodus from Egypt, right? Therefore, this prophesied return uh, has not occurred yet. And so we should be expecting to be brought back into the land which he gave to our fathers. Now, this is no surprise, because before his promised return, uh, Israel would be in seclusion for a long time. So, you know, it's it's been a long time, but that that's no surprise, because that's what was prophesied in, in Hosea 3. It says, For the children of Israel shall abide many days, Without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek Yahweh their Elohim and David their king. They shall fear Yahuwah and his goodness in the latter days. Now, did you catch that? David their king. David was from the house of, of Judah. He ruled from Hebron for the, over the house of Yehuda for seven years until the house of Israel anointed him as their king. After that time, he moved uh, his capital to Jerusalem. Uh, after the death of his, his son Solomon, the nation was divided into two houses, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The house of Israel no longer looked to the house of David for their king. So you, you, Hosea was pointing out to more, uh, he was pointing to more than a return Jose was talking about a restoration of the kingdom of Israel. Ezekiel also described the restoration of Israel. Last week we talked about the prophecy of the two sticks. Read the prophetic words that follow. Thus says Adonai Yehuah, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side, and bring them into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them, and they shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. They shall not defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and will cleanse them. Then they shall be my people, and I will be their Elohim. David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. 
Uh, they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt. And they shall dwell there, they, their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. Uh, my tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. The nations also will know that I, Yahuwah, uh, Kadosh Israel, when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Here we read about David again. So the house divided will be a house reunited. Uh, right now we see people occupying the land who are trying to keep the house of Israel out. And I suspect that the events we see occurring throughout the world will ultimately change that situation. Therefore, we need to be found watching, waiting, and ready to return home if we follow Yeshua and want to be in his covenant family. We need to be wise and maintain oil in our lamps. So as I continue packing and sifting through all my stuff, I recognize that this life is not about building a personal kingdom here on earth. It's not about building bigger and better houses to hold all our stuff. And it's definitely not about settling down. Instead, it's about our journey that leads to his house, Beit El. Yahuwah is described as the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all nomadic herdsmen. They lived in tents and continued on the covenant path with the hope of a future promise of land. When Yahuwah led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he lived in a tent as they lived in tents through their wilderness journey. We're not in the land so we should be walking the same path with the same expectation of a future promise of a return to the land. They say that home is where the heart is. How true that is. And what you consider to be your home is an indication and an indicator of the condition of your heart. You must have a circumcised heart free from the lust of Babylon in order to enter through the door of hope into the house of Elohim. Barakot, my name is Todd Bennett from Shema Israel. Shalom.